friends, it's another talk and rants and another special guest today. We've got Conor McNamara uh, from the BBC, BBC Sport. You may recognise him um, for, through various stuff he's done. He's very good on Twitter more than anything else as well. <laughs> um, but also match of the day, BBC Five Live. Uh, once he gets going with that lovely voice of his, you will recognise him, I'm sure. Uh, just to kick off, Conor, we were just talking before we started about how we're feeling about the lockdown now and all that kind of thing. How are you feeling about football now? I know we haven't got any as such, not in this country as yet. We have, of course, got the, the games in the Bundesliga now. But how are you feeling about the conversation around football, where it's all going? You know, the, there's, there's stuff every day, but whether you like it is another matter. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I find it very difficult. And I know there's a great hunger, particularly amongst Liverpool fans, for very obvious reasons that, you know, this season gets finished. And, you know, cards on the table here. Frankly, my job is going to games. You know, it, it, I have a financial interest in football being finished this season. I get my contract paid this season. Um, but I think it's going to be very difficult. And th- the main reason for it is, if you can imagine, say Liverpool play these, whatever it is, three games and win the league, is there going to be a big hunger for Liverpool fans then to play the rest of the game? You say, well, it's done now. You know, you know, do, do we really want to play out those those additional games where the, the other players will applaud the Liverpool team onto the pitch? There wouldn't be the, as big a hunger. And that's the situation that all the other clubs who don't have a trophy to play for are in. They're thinking, yeah, look, of course we want football back. Of course we'd like it. But... There's so much else going on in the world right now. Is it the most important thing? I think I think it's a really tricky one. I think, you know, the, the Troy Deeney comments at Watford have got a lot of publicity this week. I have sympathy for his situation. You know, he's got a newborn baby at home. My, my own wife works in a hospital. And every day she comes home and we're thinking, you know, is this going to be the day that some germs are brought into the house and the kids are going to get it? Or whatever? So it is difficult. It's tricky. Um, I'm craving the return of football. I'm worried it's going to be weird when it does come back. I'm, I'm worried that those those first few games just won't have the sparkle about them. You know, what we all want is the drama. We want the packed stadium. We want those goosebumps on the back of your neck when you walk up the steps and you see the pitch and we're here. You know, it's all like, That's what we all want back. What I'm worried is it's going to be quite some time before we get that. I can see a, you know, exhibition tournament side of thing. You know, for example, get the Champions League finished, get, you know, play just enough games for Liverpool to secure the league. Um, that's sort of, you know, a, a reduced version of football. I can see that happening just to get it done, just to tick the box, just to move on. Um, but but what I'm really craving is is the proper stuff to come back. And I'm I'm just worried. I you, you know, can you imagine the, the 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 first few games that it goes and then you've a Mikel Arteta type situation where a, a coach gets coronavirus and, and actually get you know gets properly ill with it. Um then suddenly it's going to be very difficult to justify playing other games around that time. So I think they're going to have to wait a lot further down the line. One other big consideration for me is, is let's just say a, a player breaks his leg in the game. Let's just say there's a Fabrice Mwamba type incident. You have to have uh, not just a doctor, not just the club staff. You have to have proper ambulances and medical staff. And then you're taking them away from where they may be needed elsewhere at the moment. So, you know, don't get me wrong. I really want it back, but I'm just worried that that, that the hunger, the people just demanding it back so soon I think it could lead to actually a longer delay then. If, if we try to come back too soon and it doesn't work, then we could be looking at a really long stretch. I wonder what you made as well, Connor. I, I mentioned the Bundesliga and you mentioned weird. And I think, you know, the return for me of the Bundesliga was weird. I tuned in last Saturday, um, sort of didn't really know what to expect, was quite excited in one way, thought it was weird in another mm-hmm. way. And then when I watched it, it, it was strange, wasn't it? I mean, I wonder what you made of it both as a football fan and a football mm-hmm. commentator. Well, over the years, and it's not been that often, but I've I've had to commentate on games behind closed doors. I've done some international games. Uh, there was, you know, various incidents, uh, you know, parts of Eastern Europe where maybe there's been a racist incident and UEFA say now you uh, as a sanction, your home games are behind closed doors, that kind of thing. Um, so I've done them f- from both aspects. One, being in a studio and just commentating off the TV pictures. And I've also done it being in the stadium. And, and being there at the time. Um, I guess there's a novelty aspect from when you're in the stadium because you feel, oh, this is a game everyone wants to watch, but I'm one of the few people allowed in. So, you know, you're, you're kind of happy to be there. You're taking your photos for Twitter, that kind of stuff. So there's a novelty about it. Um, definitely one of the great things that you can hear the players. And I think just in, in you know, normal run of my job, you're, you're so far away with all the crowd, you 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 know, the, the, the loudest bell of a roar you'll hear, but you won't be able to distinguish what they're actually saying. In that empty stadium vibe, you can hear the left back telling the winger, come on, you've got to support me, you've got to get behind. So again, great novelty value, great sort of, oh, this is an insight that I don't normally get to see. Um, however, so those, that's sort of the positive. The negative massively for me is that uh, you realise when you commentate on a game with no crowd, 
you realise the importance of a crowd to football commentary. So anytime a goal goes in, a football commentator always raises their voice. It's a goal, right? And the reason for that is because everyone in the stadium is making noise. So you have to do it to be heard. Now, instinctively, even when it's empty, you do that anyway. So you always oh, scored. He's got the goal. And you realise how terrible it sounds because <laughs> it's, it's like being a surfer on a wave. You know, you're up there and the crowd is up there and you're making the noise. If there's no wave and you're just up there shouting, you sound like someone pretending that they're doing a commentary or someone in their back garden. It's really terrible. I've had a few things, you know, for sort of adverts or stuff like that during the years where people will say, well, can, can, you, can you pretend to do a commentary? And it never sounds the real, you know, any advert you see and think about it, some of them, they will pay a lot of money for these adverts, right? You know, the big brands around the world, those sort of, you know, uh, the adverts you see ahead of a World Cup or whatever. The commentary, you always know that's not the real commentary. You know, you listen, to it, you say that's a pretend commentary. And the reason is it's been recorded without a crowd because you, your voice naturally raises and then in a company you realize oh I need to go louder here to be heard and that's an instinctive thing you you know you're not you're not thinking at the start I need to go up to eight you know you think I'm, I'm gonna go up to six but then so oh I'm suddenly found myself at nine here because the crowd is so is so noisy so th- that's going to be a weird part for for commentators um and and it it definitely makes people realize how important the crowd is you know I, I think over the years that there's been a discussion hasn't there about the importance of television money for football and um, I mean, I even know with, with Liverpool, there was a case at one stage where fans were threatening not to come because ticket prices had been increased and stuff like that. And the football fans need to be appreciated for, for, for what they add. And I think this is one of those times where we'll realise just how important, just, you know, part of the package, the entertainment value that the spectators are. I'm sure you'll be watching the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. And, you know, the, I mean, the, the crowd in basketball right close to the action. It's not as big as a football stadium, but boy, are they part of that spectacle. If you just had guys in a gym playing basketball without that crowd it wouldn't look as good on tv and i think i think that's maybe one of the positives that's going to come out of this whole period that when they play a few games behind closed doors people are going to realize you've got to treat the fans better and you've got to respect them and realize that they are part of the the entertainment package that the the the, the financial people of football are, are trying to sell yeah absolutely um i saw connor as well that you did you were talking about uh, things that you know you you missed about football that maybe you didn't expect you missed um and I, I quite like that sort of thread and i think you were talking about um the mixture of fried onions cheap yeah. be- cheap <laughs> burger meat and uh, police horse manure. <laughs> um, i mean you know I, I was i was as i say i've been watching some of the content you've done over the lockdown and i'm really interested when you were talking about y- your prep for every mm-hmm. game like 10 hours of prep and then i think you were saying on something else you'd done that you've worked out you'd done a 170 matches in mm. one year or something like that which is one every three days so it's like a it's a phenomenal amount of work and, and a phenomenal amount of dedication to it so to have that all of a sudden whipped mm. away you know that, that that must be really strange for you and, and what have you found yourself missing that you thought you didn't miss yeah you well, miss? It, it, it's it's so true and I, I think again it's you know to, to keep that analogy going you're sort of on the crest of a wave that look I, I love my job and I'm very lucky to do it and people pay you to go to football matches and the, you know the big difference between being a football fan and being a commentator is is when you go to a game you know if I go to a game at Norwich it's not like oh here's a chance to have a few babies on the train with the lads and we'll go to that restaurant we went to the last time and you know it's not you're you're kind of on your own now when you get there you'll meet colleagues but you know, everyone's sober and working and serious and, you know, we have our bit of fun, but it's not the sort of lads on tour thing that you get w- w- when you're a fan. So I spent a lot of time, you know, driving home, pulling into motorway services, eating rubbish food at one in the morning. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, those are the very unglamorous parts of it. You're always worried about getting places on time, you know, and, and the way football is so spread out, you know, the, the Monday night game might be in Southampton, the Sunday game you did might be in Newcastle. You have to get from A to B. Um, and there's a sort of pressure on that. You're thinking, oh God, Oh, what if there's bad traffic? What is it? You know, so so all that stuff sort of takes the glamour away from and you, and it makes it very much a job. Um, and yet when you're there and when the game is on and when it's a good game, and that's for me, it really doesn't matter who wins, it's that it's a good match. If you get a game that's 2 2 at half time and the whole stadium is buzzing and there's been a bit of controversy and oh, we don't know about that red card, should it have been given you? Know, and when there's that buzz and people are excited, it's just brilliant to be part of as a commentator and you feel this sounds so corny and, and cheesy but you feel that you're actually part of the game you feel you're in the match here and that your heart is pumping w- with the game and I, I absolutely love that feeling and and when you've had a really exciting match when you go home you find it difficult to sleep you know you're lying there with your eyes open staring at the ceiling because your you, your adrenaline has been going as if you've been part of the match and I do think it's it, it's one of the closest things you can have to to actually playing so I, I miss that buzz 
I don't. Mis- I mean, I, I lived in England for for twenty years. I last summer I moved back to 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 live in Ireland, and and this this season nineteen twenty, I saw a lot of the the green fabric of Aer Lingus uh, planes and the yellow plastic of Ryanair, and I did a lot of that. And there's a lot of hanging around airports when flights are delayed, and you just want to get home. And um, so I don't particularly miss that. And I think when when the lockdown started for those first two or three weeks, I actually really enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, uh, this is great. It's a chance to just be at home and spend time with the family and uh, and eat good food and all the rest of it. But but now I'm definitely getting itchy feet and, and you miss that that buzz of being on the road and, and you realise the the people, the people who you meet, you know, be it, be it, you know, su- uh, supporters, be it, be, be it, you know, journalists to a local area. So say if you're doing a game at Aston Villa, there's the certain ph- uh, photographers and journalists who cover that patch. And those guys, you, you almost subliminally, you don't really, you don't have their number in your phone. You, you, some of them, you mightn't even know their second name, but you realize, God, you see these people regularly for like a decade, you know, and that they're actually good friends of yours. And it's only when it's taken away that that, that <laughs> void kind of becomes obvious. And how, how did you how did you get into to commentary corner? Where what were the roots of you becoming what you are today? Yeah, well, my dad always worked in radio. He worked sort of a music DJ, you'd call it. You know, the equivalent of a radio one in in England. He he did that in Ireland, so he would play music. And um, radio was always a you know there was always microphones and headphones around our house, and that was a medium that we we always discussed. Um, and look, look, I love football as a kid. I knew from a very young age I wasn't going to be big enough, strong enough, you know, talented enough to become a professional footballer. But the the thought that you could do a job that would, you know, bring you to the Premier League stadiums week in, week out. I mean, that, that, at the time, it was, it felt like it'd be a brilliant job, but how would you get it? You know, I'd love to be an astronaut, but how would you become an astronaut? It was that sort of vibe. I remember as a kid, I used to have the Panini sticker albums and I used to open them up, uh, two albums. And I, you know, the way they were sort of laid out, and you know, the goalkeeper, the back four, the midfielders, the, the strikers, the way, you know, the, the sticker albums were laid out. And in my head, that was a game. And I used to, my moment, these like very old, um, you know, video footage from back in the 80s sort of stuff of me sitting at the kitchen table as a kid commentating and making up the match. You know, the left back passes it to the midfielder, gives it into whoever it is. Oh, it's a goal, you know. Um, so so that was obviously subliminally in my head. Um, but again, you, you wonder how would you ever get the opportunity? I mean, very briefly, I, I, I went to university in Manchester. So it was an Irish kid over in England and a new radio station started up who, who wanted to cover English football. And I sent in, a, it shows how long ago it was, it was a cassette, like one of the old, you know, stick a pencil in. I sent in a cassette of me pretending to report on a game. I, again, invented a game. I said, oh, you know, Man United have beaten Sheffield Wednesday 2-0. This is my report. And I sent that in. And I think they, I was only, say, 18, 19. They probably thought I was about 26, 27. They already thought, you know, I, they didn't meet me face to face. So they gave me this job. And it was, it was brilliant because every Saturday and every Sunday through my university, I went to a top flight game. And it was always a good one. You know, it was like you'd go to Elland Road, Leeds were, you know, great at the time. You'd go to Anfield, you'd go to the old Highbury. Old Trafford, wherever it was. And I went to all those games. Basically, what, you know that, that four o'clock game that was always on Sky, you know, back in the day? I was always at that game. Every Sunday, whatever the four o'clock game was, for three years of university, I was always at that match. So that was like doing an NBA in football. That was from yeah. suddenly, you know, not working in football to, to to being involved. And because it was reports, there wasn't the pressure of doing live commentary and having to do the, the same level of prep. I mean, you'd see it, what would happen? You'd buzz through, yeah, there's been a goal here. You'd come on and give your, your, your details of what happened. I mean, I'll give you actually a funny story from that that time I remember the very 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 first game I ever went to the radio station hadn't gone live yet and they were doing a trial so they'd reporters at different games a couple of weeks before the station went live and I was sent to Hillsborough and it was Sheffield Wednesday against the old Wimbledon and I was there and whatever goal happened and a cross came in and a guy headed it in and I knew who the cross was from and, and I'd written it down and I was saying okay there's been a goal here I can do the report and I could hear the background these other journals they were like who, who sent in the cross and I, I remember, the, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this now, but I remember thinking, huh, well, if you don't, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, you know, I mean, I've done my, my report's going to be brilliant. I'm not going to tell you who I thought. And I didn't realize what an idiot I was being. But, that, you know, I, this mentality of, you know, this is like an exam in school or something, you know, who's going to do the best. And, and nowadays when you're in, in press boxes, and you know, this could be Champions League finals, World Cups, whatever, people want that reassurance. You know, I'm pretty sure it was Alexander Arnold who sent in the cross, but was it? You know, and, and they will check with each other. And it doesn't matter if you write for the Times or you write for the Guardian or you write for the, the local paper. You know, those guys will all share the information with each other and of, of those mechanical sort of things. And and again, it was something that I had to learn that I just didn't know that you realize that there's this little, you know, group. And, and it's not it's not about, oh, there's a press agenda and they don't like a man. It's not, it's not that sort of stuff. It's, it's helping each other out because nobody can see everything. Nobody knows everything, and that reassurance of hearing from someone else um, that, that that they're on, you know that what you thought was right actually is right. That then gives you more confidence in your broadcast or, or when you're writing things down. But yeah, I went from from doing those reports. I, I was quite lucky to to stumble into doing a commentary, a single commentary, because that station got the rights for one game, 
And then from there, I wasn't a student commentator. I wasn't a wannabe commentator. I could say, well, look, I am a football commentator. And it sort of just went from there. And I was, I was lucky, right place at the right time. Got in, Mark Lawrenson told me that BBC were looking for, for young football commentators. And they sent in a tape. I think I'd moved on from cassettes. I think it was a DAT or a mini disc or something <laughs> at that stage. And I sent that in. And again, you know, they, they said, yeah, look, come on, c- come in and we'll have a listen to you. And, and it all just sort of went from there. So right place at the right time. And then I, I suppose you've got to be dedicated to take the opportunity. I think, as you, you know, in my, in my mid 20s, I didn't go out on Friday nights. You know, my friends would be out on the beer having, you know, and I had to have my head right. I had to be on a 6 a.m. train to London. I had to whatever, you know, and, and that's the sort of commitment you've got to make. And, and you've got to be willing to to make those sacrifices to, to, to get place in the business. And look, you can get away with it to a point and don't get me wrong. Sometimes you got to have a nice meal, you have a glass of wine on Friday night and you have a game the next day. But if you did it on a regular basis, you, you'd be cut out because you don't get away with it nowadays. You know, everybody yeah. knows everything in football. You can't spoof people. And you mentioned, um, you mentioned there, Connor, Panini stickers. <laughs> um, I, I think it'd be good if you talked about the way you prep because you, mm. you use stickers, don't you? I do. I, I try to actually find, um, I'll show you know what I got. Oh, but I got an actual example here. Uh, Okay, this is very, very basic. I was doing, I was doing a, a voiceover for a game. But if you can imagine that all of these are stickers. So if you, if you were to send out an envelope um, with an address on it, you just send out a hundred of them. You, you'd do it up in a template in your computer. You'd write in all the addresses. And when it would print out, it would be on these stickers and you'd stick one on each envelope. So th- that's the stickers I use. But instead of an address, I put the player's picture. I put his name, his number, his age, his number of caps, how many goals he scored this season. Has he been sent off against this opponent before? Whatever, it's seven or eight little pieces of detail relative to this match about this player. So that's my week's work, if you like. If I'm doing three games a week, I've got to do three sets of, of that. The reason I do the labels is because you don't obviously know till an hour before kickoff which 11 are going to start the game. You don't know the formation. So by by covering all my base, so you know, if you think when you get your match day program, the back of the program, all those names and numbers and guys who you know aren't going to play or whatever, I've got all their stats done. So if some 17-year-old comes in and makes his debut, I can say that's his debut, he hasn't played or he's scored for the under-21s or whatever it is, uh, if it's a player who hasn't played for some time, I'll still have done all the prep in him. So I can say, this is his first appearance since September the 1st or whatever it is. So you don't have to look that stuff up at the time you've got it. And and I lay them out in their formations. So the goalkeeper goes in, the back four, the midfielders. And then I've got other information on the side. So stuff to do with the referee, the other games that are on. Because if we're doing a game on Five Live, you know, the way it works is we're commentating on the game and you'll hear in your ears, you're right, there's been a goal at at, at wherever, uh, Deepdale, uh, can you go to the reporter, Alistair Yeomans? Right, so you hear that in your ear and you're all right, but Liverpool are on the attack here. So you just hold off. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, the shot goes wide. It's nil-nil here. Let's go to Deepdale. Here's Alistair Yeomans. You know, so you, you all the time have got this information. Now, when they say go to Deepdale, as you, you know, the game is on, it's really exciting. Like, oh God, what game was that again? I can't remember. So you've got it written down in front of you. Know, Preston are playing Sheffield Wednesday, whatever it is. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that sort of homework done in advance means you enjoy doing the commentary so much more if if you're there at the time thinking oh God, i don't know what's what and you're you know <laughs> going through a book trying to what, what's the referee's name or you know whatever it is you'd be straight you wouldn't whereas if, if you think i've done the work in advance i've done my homework now i'm just going to enjoy the game and and i think it sounds better as a commentator when that happens and what about the sort of the the unseen challenges if you like connor so you know we we obviously get to hear it on Five Live and on Match of the Day and things like that. We we get the polished product, but we don't see everything that goes on behind the scenes. And one, you know, when, when people who work in broadcast or in print seem to talk about the job, a lot of them talk about, you know, how interviews, for instance, can be difficult at times. Even even managers or players that you might know a little bit, just the idea that you're getting them as soon as they come off the pitch and their emotions are flying everywhere. Sometimes they may not appreciate a certain question or comment or whatever it may be. Uh, have you had any moments like that where it's... Yeah, it, it, it's like, you, you look, you like eating sausages, you don't want to see how they're made, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I personally, look, I my least favorite part of the job is that post-match interview and it's a strange one because it's such a privileged position it really is you know you're in Anfield and you've had tens of thousands of people watching the game and you get to walk you know while you literally through the crowd get in the thing get down to the base level get in and you get to go into the tunnel I mean that's where everyone would love to be right and you're there Sadio Mane and his socks walking up I mean it's amazing right this is brilliant and and you feel wow I should be so happy to be here and I find it very unsatisfying I find you you almost never get a quality line from those post-match interviews and the reason is, is they're still in game mode. You know, they've been out there shouting at the referee, battling for every inch and, you know, every every decision counts, every little factor. They're in game mode and they come into you and they're still a bit competitive. So they're, you know, they're looking to pick holes in your questions. Right? Why, 
what are you trying to imply by that? You know, because they're still in the way. I think if you just let them off, have their shower, do other stuff, come back to you two hours later, you'd have a much better, you know, you'd actually, they'd say, well, yeah, and actually thinking about it, maybe we should have tried that or this didn't work for us. But the time, they're not conceding anything in those. You know, if you look at those post-match interviews, very rarely will you hear a manager say, yeah, look, we, we got that wrong today. They don't do it. And that's why, you know, the written guys, if you, you know, the, the, the good articles that you read, they're all done midweek at the training ground out of the pressure cooker of a match. But look, People want to see it. When a game is over, you're watching and telly, you want to see the guy still in his shirt or the one he swapped, sweat still pouring off him and you want to hear what he says. The trouble for me is it's not very satisfying that you don't get great answers. It's just, yeah, look, we're good today. We move on to the next one. Yawn. You know, I, I just, I don't find it fun. And 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 they kind of look at you a bit and just say, oh, here's your man. I have to answer his questions now. And you, well, I don't, I don't really want to be here either, mate. You know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a funny one, but, um, but it, it is nice to, to see behind the scenes. You get to know people and definitely there's a case, you know, when players retire, they will recognize you as someone who they saw regularly in tunnels and, th- and then they'll be more relaxed and talk to you. And it is, I mean, probably one of the, the most satisfying parts of our job is the, we get to work with, with brilliant people, you know, people who are very successful players or managers and they get to be sitting beside us as co-commentators. You know, I mean, so lucky people, like I mentioned Mark Lawrence before, I mean, such a, a well-decorated player. Chris Waddle, I really enjoy working That's with. Great. I mean, he's, he's a bona fide legend is Chris and he's a great guy. You know, there's, there's great stories of being on the road with Chris and having nights out and he, he's just wonderful company. Um, and I think what I definitely find over the years, the guys who won the big medals and who were renowned as being excellent players, they're actually the low maintenance people to work with because they know, you know what I mean? They, 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 they they're not trying to prove anything to you. I think some of the players who maybe didn't quite get to the top but have become personalities or become media people, they're trying a little bit harder to show why they're there and they, they can maybe be a bit more high maintenance. But um, that to me is 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 the more enjoyable part of the job is getting the insight, getting to work with people, just seeing how professional they are. You know, some managers, and I, I think we, we, we sort of maybe downplay the, the intelligence part of football. I mean, these guys do their homework. They'll have a pattern for it. They're making notes. They're drawing out tactics, stuff that's even above our head or for the general consumption. But they're they're analyzing and they can see three minutes into a match, they've worked out what a team is going to do. Um, and it's just great to see that behind that curtain to see how they do that kind of stuff. Uh, interested as well, Connor, just in terms of your your style, if you like, because obviously every commentator is, is different, has their own personal style, probably even in terms of how they prep everything, really. Um, and, you know, I, I regularly listen to Five Live. I do gen- genuinely love it. I'm not just saying it because I'm on to you. And, you know, so I, I'm used to, to various different voices and various different styles now. Um, and with, with yourself, I always get the impression that, you know, you do obviously genuinely love footy. You can tell that you're passionate about it yourself. And sometimes I think, which is great to listen to, you get, you get caught up in it. You can hear it in your voice. And you're like, oh, my God, and all that. And, you're like, yeah. and, it, and it's fantastic to listen to. And I just wonder, because that is your style and that is, is how you do it, how how hard is it to sort of maintain the, the professional tone, if you like? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because sometimes... No. Because you're almost becoming the fan there, aren't you? Yeah, no, and it, 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 there's there's a very good thing that was said to me when I when I started out. There's a guy that you might hear his voice occasionally at Five Live, Rob Nothman, and he Rob does um sort of you know basically mentoring or you know tutoring of particularly the, the younger people coming through, where he will listen to your work and he'll he'll meet you face to face and he'll you know pick holes in it, frankly, but in in a very constructive way. Um, and he he absolutely said that to say you know that you know the whole thing about getting excited and and he said you know what what you always do is you always have to leave yourself. A gap. So if, if we take the scale of one to ten, so ten is the World Cup winning goal in the last minute when it's four four and your team has come back from four nil down and you've now won five, you know, like that that's the wowest it can be. So if if there's an incredible goal along the way, so let's say and I was actually I was thinking about famous Liverpool goals I've come to before chatting to you, and I remember being at Luton back in the day when Jabby Alonso from inside his own half scored, you know, and that's one of those Wah! what if someone else did it? Two minutes later, you know, where do you go? What if someone else did it later from 10 yards further back? You know, you, you always have to realize as it goes up, right, hold it there, hold it there, right, really excited. Right, Once you go up here, you enter the only dogs can hear what you're saying, you know. <laughs> and and I think this is a snobbish thing with commentators. You know, you sometimes hear, you know, maybe those FA Cup goals, exciting moments, and a commentator just loses. And what annoys me, and I think annoys a lot of my colleagues, is people always go, listen to this, brilliant. Look, the commentator from the local team and wherever who, you know, won in the first time, listen to this brilliant commentary. And I think that's terrible. Anyone could do it. It's just rah! But what people love is the emotion they're showing. They love, look at this professional person has got so caught up in this that they're losing it, you know. Yeah. But but to me, 
to me, the, the skill is if it's really, really exciting to still be measured, to still be able to convey the information. I think my colleague John Murray does it brilliantly. I mean, that John is, is so calm, real gentleman, and he commentates on the biggest moments. And when they happen, you can still hear every syllable of everywhere. And you know he's excited. You know, you can tell by, wow, this must be a good goal because he's, he's very animated here. But it's not, Rah! you know, he is giving you the information. And then he'll pick one little detail and he'll say, and down in the touchline, your man has picked up his lucky teddy or whatever. You know, he'll have picked up <laughs> one little thing that, you know, would, would otherwise be lost in, in the big sort of canvas in front of him. And John's brilliant at doing that. But I think I think that's the talent. When the amazing thing happens, get the context. Find what, why did that happen? That defender slipped. The goalkeeper should have done this. But, you know, not to be totally caught up in the emotion. And then, look, there's always going to be a time when, for whatever reason, you just you, you hit that top barometer. Um, but I, I just think, yeah, the, the key is not to be... I think what it is, if you're driving in your car and there's a game, and if the commentator is up here all the time, you kind of go, the game can't be that good. I mean, he's exaggerating. I don't believe him. And trust is a big thing. Because if, if you say, that's a terrible tackle... People say, ah, yeah, he thinks every tackle is a terrible tackle. So, you know, but you, oh, that, that really was a bad tackle. Right. OK, I trust him. You know, there's, there's that bond between the listener and the commentator. So it's it's a balancing act. Um, but, yeah, I, like, I, I find over the years that the games when you you're really enjoying it, it it's almost musical. And like, I, I'm not a good singer. I don't really play an instrument very well or anything. But what I find is there's a rhythm and a tempo and you feel you feel you're actually part of the song that's been sung here or whatever. And. And, and it's about keeping that under control and not veering off into into something that the audience won't understand. Oh, what what about sort of Liverpool moments then, Connor? Any sort of incidents, matches, goals, interviews that sort of jump out at you yeah. about Liverpool? Well, I mentioned that Jabby Alonso. I remember yeah. being at Kenilworth Road, very cold night, brilliant goal. I mean, and and he was one of those players who would do that. And I think as a commentator, you know, you you expect the big number nine when it's a glancing header, the exit, the edge of the six yard box you're always very comfortable who you, who it is, even if he's got a, a regulation standard haircut, even if he's, you can't see his number, you kind of know that's the big lad up front, whatever. Uh, if it's a little Michael Owen guy, you know, you just know who it is. Something like that, a shot from midfield, you think, whoa, who's that? I remember, um, Fig- was it Figaro? No, not Figueroa. Was it Figaro? I can't remember. The um, Wigan player scored from inside his own half against yeah. Stoke and I did that game. And that was one of those where you go, whoa, who was that? Because you don't expect it. The thing with the Xabi Alonso goal was, of course that was him you know nobody I mean that that was definitely him so even though he's looking towards you you can't see his number is back busy midfield not expecting a shot whoa who did that Jeffy Alonso because you know he's got that in his locker he was a great player to watch I remember one I mean little things thing I think it's important to say we're talking about interviews and tunnels and stuff Rafa Benitez was probably my favorite manager to deal with not that I've got any personal friendship with him or great bond but just such a polite gentleman. You know, he was one of those guys, even if his team loses, he'll shake your hand before the interview. He'll say thank you after the interview. He'll listen to your questions. And even at times you could tell he's, he's he's annoyed about a decision or he's got a problem with this, that or the other. He was always a real gentleman to deal with. And I, and I he showed respect to people. He was like, you're here doing your job. You know, and some managers just treat you like you are a stain on the wall. You know, why do I have to be talking to you? You're an unimportant person. He 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 was a lovely gentleman to deal with. And, you know, particularly his Liverpool days, I remember that. And, you know, still is where, where, where else he's been. Um, I remember one day at a European game somewhere getting in a lift. I, was, I don't know where it was, Germany or somewhere. And I was lost and I was trying to find my way. I, I'd gone up to the press box to check was our ISDN lines working for the next day. And then I was going back downstairs to where the press conference was and I, whatever staircase I couldn't find. And I saw this lift. I said, look, I'll get down anyway. It'll have to get me there. So I pressed the button on the lift and it was Sammy Hoopia. And who would it have been? Who's that German uh, defender? It was a Babel or someone like that. I know it was around that era anyway. And I got in the lift and they were there and they just thought I was some German guy who was working in the stadium. And they were like saying these, you know, basically bitching about their teammates and stuff. And I was like, this is brilliant. And I was, you know, I, oh, he, look, look, we keep telling him to do it and he just won't do it. And, you know, it, was just, it, was, it was this wonderful sort of uh, fly on the wall sort of insight. Um, I remember things like uh, seeing Diddy Haman, you know, sneaking a cigarette in a car park of a thing. And I remember thinking, why well, he's a professional footballer and he smokes, you know what I mean? Like, how could that be the case? And, you know, just little things like that, sort of behind the scenes stuff that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't always appreciate. But look, over the years, I've, I've always enjoyed going to Anfield. We used to, you know, the old press box, the, the, the stand that they've yeah. knocked down now. That was always really cramped. That was that was uncomfortable. Once you were in, you sort of had to stay in. And it was annoying because you want to go get a cup of tea at half time or you want to go to the loo or whatever. And, you, you know, it was proper. You'd be climbing over people. Um, and then on Five Live for a long time, our commentary position was the other side, the centenary stand, you know, the little gantry that pops down. Yeah. And that was actually great because we, we had that just to ourselves. 
So you would go over, you go through a, one of the kind of corporate boxes things. There was a little entrance up to the, the top of the stand and there was a staircase. Now the rules were, it was like a health and safety fire thing that that, that staircase had to go up an hour, I think it was even more than an hour before kickoff. It was just they couldn't have a stair where if someone fell and once spectators were in the ground. So you had to get up there really early. There wasn't a proper toilet up there. So you're up there. If that game goes to extra time, you're up there for three hours, you know. And uh, eventually what they did was they brought in a little commode thing, like uh, the kind of thing you'd have in a caravan, like a little, you know, thing you press it and blue liquid flows, you know, and they end up putting one in. A... But you're up there with, you know, with proper legends, you know, people like, uh, you know, Jim Beglin and, and uh, who has Liverpool legends with their been, but, you know, Laro and all these guys. And you're literally pissing in a pot, you know what I mean? And it, it's just so funny. And one of the biggest football clubs in the world, one of the most famous stadiums. But that was a great view up there. You'd walk along this country, you could see all the spectators below you. And although you were very high, it just gave you a lovely perspective. You know, things like offside calls, you could see them so clearly. Um, and I also I also remember it being a really good perspective. So people will think, um, and you know, to be fair, Liverpool fans who go to Anfield, they, they've got their angle of the ground that they look at goals from. People who only watch on TV, they only see the ground from one side. You know, so the, the cop is away to the right always when you're watching TV. And where for us in that position, the far side, the cop was always to the left. And, you know, it's funny how great goals that I've seen scored, in my eyes, you know, it's a mirror image to what it is on TV. So it's almost like you've seen a different goal. Sometimes it's better from the other angle, you know. So um, just great memories of going to Anfield over the years. But uh, yeah, that, that old press box was tiny. I hated that. <laughs> In terms of lockdown, then just to, just to wrap up, uh, Connor, what, what, what bits of content, what things that have been out there have, have you been consuming and have you enjoyed? Because I mean, everyone's, including ourselves, we've all had to sort of think on our feet a little bit and, and, and try different things, try new things. Everyone's doing stuff from home. What stuff have you seen that, you, that you've enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, in terms of works, I've done a few sort of retrospective commentaries for FIFA where they, they send me old games and World Cups and I put commentary on it now, but you're sort of pretending it's at the time, you know, you're trying to make it yeah. sound at the time. Um, so a few games to the, the 1998 World Cup. I mean, England should have done better than you look back, the team that England had really was a good team and and they, they, they you know that that problem of the knockout stages of uh, of major tournaments it, it really makes you wonder you know that those players should have achieved more together um i definitely think looking back at the old games as well the game's better now you know and we all have the rose tinted glasses and we look back and of course there's brilliant individuals but there is undoubtedly you know your average right or left back now is is i'm certain a better technical player than it was yeah. back in the day the way you know you almost never see a bad first touch now. Whereas looking back at games, even around the 98 World Cup, back around the 1982 World Cup, so many times the centre half would play it out to the fullback who'd miscontrol it and it would go out for a throw in. I mean, nowadays it'd be like, that'd be on the too good, too bad on match of the day. Look at this yeah, terrible. Yeah. You know, that happened six times per half in the old days. There was just the, the technical quality and everything happened so fast. You know, back in those days, guys would take a ball down, he'd roll it in front of him, he'd look up, he'd have loads, you know. Nowadays, you've got three opponents gegging pressing on you and, you know, the, the, the quality of the game. Now, don't get me wrong, had Daglish or Maradona, whoever yeah, they played now, yeah, they would have been coached differently. They would have had you know, different skills and yet their their personal brilliance would still shine through. And I, I, I definitely believe that. But I just think in terms of the high standard, you know, Maradona hurdling over defenders who are just throwing themselves at the tackle. Nowadays, you know, they'd stand off. They, you know, the, the tactics of the game have improved. And I think it's, it's a more, looking back at, at moments, goals, you know, look at the 1970 World Cup. Those goals Brazil score are incredible. But have you ever watched the full 90 minutes? It's not, it's not great. It, and that sounds weird to say. Everyone says, oh, what a great final. Brilliant goals. So many shots ballooned miles off target. They just <laughs> toe poke everything. And it, that Brazil team, they toe poked shots. And what happens is one of them goes in the top corner and we say, oh, they're brilliant. I'm not exaggerating here. There'll be 12 others that went miles wide, like not six feet wide, 30 feet wide. Um, so it's it's like, you know, if you've enough monkeys and typewriters, one of them will type out Shakespeare. That was a little bit of the case. So, uh, but yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff we watch you for, for work. Um, I've, I've loved that Michael Jordan documentary. I've, I've really got into that. That has filled the void for me of not watching live games. I've, I've really got into that. And I'm not a huge basketball fan, but that, that's that's made me really appreciate watching that. Um, but yeah, nothing replaces. Looking back at these old games, we we, we all get bored of that pretty quickly. Uh, it, it's the unknown. It's when you don't know what's going to happen. That's what we like about, uh, about the sport. Well, it, it does all seem to be pointing in the direction of the Premier League return at some point in June. So hopefully we will hear you back on the radio then, Connor, and on Match of the Day too. Uh, thanks very much for joining us on Talking Reds today. Been an absolute pleasure. Top man. Uh, thanks very has, much. That has been it. Friday's Talking Reds. We shall be back next week, hopefully with more special guests as well. Up the Reds.